been with the dredging on our harbor. I uh, would like to make a point. We do have a tip jar that's starting to be passed around. Please continue. Um, everybody knows where the bathrooms are. The speakers today, we're going to start off with Larry Doss, uh, Harbor Commissioner, who's going to be explaining, uh, give us a status report on the where we are on the dredging regulatory compliance. Uh, Pat Higgins, another Harbor Commissioner, is going to be following up in terms of what is left to be done, what kind of decisions need to be made. And we have uh, Todd Reinecke here, who kind of wrap, well, actually, I think Todd's going to follow Larry, but uh, kind of what the dredging progress means to us and potential local users of the harbor, the boutique type of users, I think he's a perfect example of what we can look forward to. And, uh, with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Larry and a uh, very questions. informal. Questions. Questions. When we have questions, uh, please stand up, be very clear, and try to be short on your uh, questions, mainly because we do want to make sure you're heard on the video. We don't mind if I sit up here. So, you know, <laughs> You're asking the speakers to repeat the questions for the camera. And I will be repeating the questions for the camera. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Okay. Larry, you want to start? <laughs> hey there. Hey, thank you for the uh, invite to come and visit today. And it's a pretty exciting topic, talking about mud. Uh, but it is pretty passionate because the mud is, uh, is the key, as you know, I've explained this group too much that the key to uh, shipping in Humboldt Bay and being open 12 months a year is, is dealing with the, the dredging. Uh, we just got approval, the Harbor District just got approval, permits are in hand, so we're going to start dredging uh, Woodley Island and Fields Landing Boat Yard um, by mid-September. The uh, spoils from that that will be going out to Hoods. The handout that I, I just passed out is just for reference purposes. Uh, it shows the, the federal shipping channels and the uh, terminals. And then also on the other side, it shows the uh, different locations for uh, dredge spoils. The dredge spoils are, the like I said, the, the key for uh, any of our dredging programs. Uh, we've been shot down uh, in my in my tenure on the Harbor District, a couple of three times, and it mainly has to do with uh, dredge spoils and a little bit of mitigation. So, uh, just recently, the Coastal Commission approved the Harbor District's uh, dredging plan and permits, and they did not put a really put an end date to that approval. So that was pretty exciting to see. We'll see what happens in the future as far as pushback on that. Uh, they approved two different methods, as well as uh, state water quality has approved, and uh, fish and wildlife has approved. Two different methods of dredging for the district. When the district's dredging, we're um, looking at beneficial reuse, which uh, Pat's gonna speak more to that uh, shortly. Beneficial reuse is, uh, is a good way of just saying we're gonna recycle the mud. So there's several locations around the bay that we have uh, earmarked for uh, what we call uh, on land disposal, dewatering. We have to pull the mud out of the bay and dry it up, make it dirt, and then the dirt goes in a dump truck and goes someplace. So uh, there's several entities that are interested in that dirt. It's good, clean dirt. Every time we, we uh, take mud out of the bay, it all gets tested extensively for cleanliness and compatibility to go elsewhere. And then um, it's also tested uh, for uh, depths and quantities. So, so it's looked at a lot of different ways. It's, it's a very, Humboldt Bay is, I would say, the cleanest, cleanest bay in the West Coast, if not maybe even the country. And um, so the, the spoils from the dredging, uh, likewise, is very clean and, and has lots of options of going elsewhere. Caltrans has expressed interest. Uh, Danco out here in Samoa has expressed interest in taking hundreds of thousands of cubic yards. And uh, then there's some other entities. So uh, the, the beneficial reuse and uh, the locations of where we, we go with the dredge spoils is super important. One of the locations um, is, a, is a dry lagoon just maybe 100 yards 
uh, to the northwest here. And uh, that one was our target this year to use for uh, bringing the spoils in. And we were going to try to uh, do uh, handle a lot of the dredging aspects as a district um, in-house. And that was our B plan in case uh, the bids came in too high and we couldn't afford it. So uh, one, of the, one of the challenges we ran into was uh, water quality wanted us to, to put a rubber liner in this dry lagoon and clean water. And um, that was a multi-million dollar project. It doesn't mean we're not going to do it in the future. But I think uh, we've met with all of those entities, and uh, especially water quality, and they see the benefit of uh, laying off some of those uh, regulations they put on us initially, and they, they uh, agree that we have a, a unique situation in Humboldt Bay that maybe needs to be treated a little bit differently than, than a universal treatment across the board. Another uh, entity that's given us some positive uh, feedback and we still uh, need to work on them quite a bit, is uh, the EPA. The EPA is um, one of the limiting factors for the, the dredge spoils also, in that um, the, the, the dredge spoils are very fine, and they're too fine, and because they're too fine to their the EPA standards, um, it's, not, it's not considered acceptable to use in some of the, some of the locations we've looked at, such as um, the beach, and uh, nourishing the beach, uh, they don't they don't like it because it's too fine. And so we're going to work on them over the course of the next few years about redefining and giving maybe an exception to Humboldt Bay for those spoils. And uh, we have um, actually lots of data, uh, decades of data of pumping uh, from Humboldt Bay pumping sediment onto the beaches, and there's uh, zero zero effect. Uh, there's no negative effect, no positive effect. It's just a, it's just a zero, and um, that's that's good in the in the terms of uh, being able to look at the beach and going back and, and helping the beach. If you look in Southern California, it's not uncommon to see dump trucks go right out onto the beach near the surf and having you know cats out there grading sand or hauling in sand like crazy to to uh, reestablish uh, eroding beaches and uh, it's treated a little bit different up here. So that, that's one of the options. One of the goals of the uh, Harbor District with ongoing dredging with um, the new permit plan that we have in, in place is to have multiple locations to go with the dredge spoils. So the beach is, is definitely an option, although we're not pushing that as the number one option. The lagoons, and then we have, um, there's cells around the bay that can also be used um, to take dredge spoils, as well as, like I said, uh, private entities like uh, Danco here. Uh, Caltrans is, is interested in that. And um, that's it's encouraging because we got probably uh, 150 to 300,000 yards um, that we need to catch up on, and then we'll be on a normal routine of, of dredging on a probably a yearly basis. So that's the, that's the Harbor District side of dredging. And then the Corps of Engineers uh, is, is luckily not out of the Harbor District's checkbook because it's huge, but uh, the Corps has the responsibility of the shipping channels. The shipping channels uh, have just recently been dredged. We, we had probably not the best communication with the Corps this year. We had some, some opportunities to uh, to get a couple of easy passes with the dredge, one of the dredges that uh, smaller ones that was in the bay, and um, they, uh, it's starting to affect both the city and the harbor district's uh, marinas. So, such as uh, the Eureka Marina for the city and the uh, Woodley Island Marina, um, it, we're looking at uh, dredging. The district's looking at dredging at the marina, for instance, right now. And when we take those. Uh, limits or the, the depths down at the uh, Woodland Island Marina, we're actually going to probably be in a position where we're going to start receiving um, flow from the ocean or bay floor from the shipping channel, which will be a little bit higher and, and floating in towards the marina. So um, one of the things that would be very helpful and we're, gonna, we're continuing to work with the Corps on is the message to the Corps that we need to have all of those inner channels dredged. They haven't been touched in probably over a decade or two. And um, it's important for all of the, the smaller entities, the Harbor District and the city, to have those dredged so that when, when we're maintaining, we're not, we're not 
inviting more spoils quickly into, into the space we've just touched. Yeah, Rex? Hey, Larry, how much are you uh, having to pay a yard for this dredging, this next dredging, this 650 or 70,000? How much, how many, how many yards do you expect to have to 350,000? I believe we're at 20, 22,000 yards. 22,000 yards. 1,500 is out of, uh, 1,900 is out of, 1,900 is coming out of Fields Landing, so that's really good for your district. And the rest will come out of Willie Island Marina, and it's on a it's on a fixed base. Uh, we basically said we have 600 grand to spend, and Dutra had a barge in the bay, and so for that amount of money, we were able to get 22,000 cubic yards, which which was a good deal, and usually not duplicable because you'd have to pay 500 grand just to mobilize uh, the equipment to get there. So it's somewhere around 28. I guess just quick math in my head. It sounds like around 27, 28 dollars a a yard. And some of the bids were as high as 60. Last year we were looking at some in the 40s too. Yeah. So it's uh, it's usually very expensive. The, the plan this year is that all those dredge spoils are going out to Hoods. And Hoods is on that the map there. Um, Hoods is uh, is usually the most expensive alternative, and that's why the beneficial reuse is an option also for the for the district to look at. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, hey, Larry, could you uh, explain what the biggest differences are from Southern California beaches to our beaches, at least in the Harbor uh, Commission's uh, um, opinion? Sure. I, well, and, I think... And what, what the conflict yeah. is with what they're doing down there and what what you'd like to do up here. Yeah. I, I think... Um, and just, I, I have to speak more, more for me than as the whole overall district. To me, it looks like the um, the biggest difference is that the harbor the harbor district's treated a little bit differently than if it was located in Southern California by the Coastal Commission, and it would be very helpful if we had a strong local coastal plan in place um, would alleviate some of that oversight from the Coastal Commission. Um, that's that's a, a big big animal to deal with, but it's something that needs to be done. Um, the, uh, the big difference in Southern California and, and up here, uh, they, they say it's not so, but it, we obviously see that it's so, that the Coastal Commission definitely treats uh, the northwest corner of California much differently than the southwest corner of California. Uh, so we need, we need to be uh, vocal about that and, and bring some real good science to the table. And I, I, I think we have it. I think we have some really good uh, records going back decades that um, that you know, for instance, with the, the beneficial reuse on the on the uh, beaches, it has no harmful effect. It might not look pretty for 30 to 60 days, but it's not. It doesn't have a negative effect. So it's all about nourishing those beaches. And that at some point, we're going to have to really strongly, as a community, look at that and say, yeah, this is okay. We need to start nourishing this beach because. You know, as, as erosion hits all of the coastlines, as sea level rise, you know, for a lot of factors, we have to start looking at that and, and demanding that we're treated a little bit more equally as a, as a sector of the state, for sure. Um, that's, that's one of the big factors. The, uh, I think the other factors just in how we're governed up here, uh, I think uh, just a little bit more trust building needs to happen between the Harbor District and uh, the other entities, and I, and I believe that's happening. I think that's that's moving in a real positive direction. We've got uh, definitely some some negative baggage that we're carrying, and I, and I don't really know what that is, but I step into it every once in a while. <laughs> um, so that you know that kind of thing, we have to just build that trust within the entities. And um, sometimes I feel like um, that the Harbor District needs to step a little bit firmer on uh, with those entities too. You know, really. The Harbor District's a, a permitting agency, and it, it says yay or nay to several of the similar permits that Fish and Wildlife and Coastal and Water Quality also review. To me, as a taxpayer, that to me that looks like they're on equal footing and should be treated as such and should have the same voice as those. You know, and, uh, so that's that's a little bit on the soapbox of, of going my direction, but that's that's what I see as a direction we've got to, we've got to work on. Thank you. Larry. You bet. Dennis? Uh, it, it's really nice to hear some positive uh, uh, potential uh, that we're actually going to have a harbor and not just a kayak lagoon. 
So we appreciate right. hearing about hearing that. How long how long do you think it will take to correct the uh, lack of dredging and maintenance that occurred the last 10 plus years? Well, if, if all things remain the same and you know we didn't have any special event that brought in extra sediment, it's gonna take a couple, three or four years to to get up to where we're on a normal maintenance level. And and some of it is gonna take, you know, we don't we don't study with this, they, they use the term soundings, we don't use the soundings or the or the tests uh, on the soil makeup until we're ready or, or contemplating permitting on in a certain part of the bay. Uh, but overall, um, you know, the, the whole bay is very, very clean, and so... Um, Are you guys considering a long-term strategic plan that would have this, those type of considerations marked out 10 or 12 years in advance? Yeah, yeah. Right, right now, we're working on, um, of course, just getting it done this year because it's so critical to just get that um, element of dredging completed now because it's been so long. But then once once it's uh, underway, we'll, we'll have to be creative on finding funding and whatnot to, to maintain uh, the plan going forward. The biggest thing is we've got permits and um, we're, we're moving positively. So um, that's, that's pretty much uh, the, the biggest message I've got is we got to remember that there's two different entities for dredging, the, the federal entity and, and the local entity. And uh, we are, uh, as a district, um, very excited to, to start seeing uh, dredging occurring about the middle of next month. And then, and then we're going to start right away on looking at the following year, what we can do in that cycle. That season of dredging is very tight, so that's, that's uh, one of the other elements that can't do anything about it, but that's just, it's a tight schedule for dredging, and we, we've got to be ready to jump when it's ready to go. Season's open. Yeah. Uh, I know one of the things that have um, been discussed about the uh, dredge spoils is using to build up some of the shoreline and, mm -hmm. and uh, create living shoreline, which is a big uh, plus. One of the things I think is a, a little bit amiss, however, is um, just recently Caltrans uh, got the uh, 101 project approved and the mitigation was to essentially rototill uh, Indian Island, the whole thing, and that's going to release a tremendous amount of sediment into the bay and right around the marinas. And it just, it, it just seemed like that was kind of an ironic twist to a, a mitigation that could actually cause quite a bit of problem. Yeah. We yeah. know that once the commission, one of you guys uh, had mentioned that once some of those projects, the smaller ones, took place, that's a pretty big one. Yeah. That, you know, there's all this uh, detritus just moving around and floating around and, and causing, you know, smaller problems. But 172 acres right near the marinas, it just seems like uh, a little bit kind of counterproductive to what you guys are trying to do. Well, if it flows, hopefully it flows and lands in the federal channel. And not not on the, the sides, but I, I'm not super familiar with that part of the mitigation, so uh, I'm sure it's going to be something that the district's going to have to react to at some point. I want to pass this over to Pat because he's got a bunch of great information on the on the. Uh, before on the Pat starts, uh, if you have a question or comment, please raise your hand. The purpose is people do watch the video, and we've gotten complaints that they can't hear the question from the audience. So I like that. Least get you on with the microphone. Go ahead, Pat, sorry. I'm going to go ahead and use the podium. Kind of security blanket, I guess. I didn't bring sufficient handouts for everyone, but circulating, you'll find a map that's very instructive about uh, what's going on with regulation of dredging. And the map shows eelgrass. And the eelgrass is, in fact, in the same footprint as it was in 1870. We're also the only bay, or one of the few bays, on the West Coast that are going to experience an increase in eelgrass as a result of climate change. So we have a functional ecosystem with, eagle, with eelgrass growing everywhere that it can in the bay. And then you'll see black around the edges, which I like because it's dairy cows but I don't like because it used to be salt marsh. So our salt marsh is compromised by 
and our eelgrass is, is essentially intact. Uh, and so our job is actually to restore eelgrass to improve the function of the ecosystem of Humboldt Bay. I'm going to do a few things in my remarks before I get to the meat of the matter, but the reason we can't do anything, and we're in regulatory gridlock, I will say it, uh, today I'm going to be a little more direct than Larry. I have been sitting by and watching gridlock for a while now, and uh, even with my tolerance for patience and boredom at 68, it is taxing me to the limit. Eelgrass and the long fin smelt. But in a moment, <clears throat> Larry saying surf disposal. Santa Cruz has already got 500 feet off the shore surf disposal. The jetty stops sediment from the eel. The beaches north of the entrance are starved. So therefore, dumping sediment into that littoral cell, into the surf, is our future. And we need to get to that. And we found, we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to prove that it doesn't hurt a perch. It doesn't hurt a, a sand flea out there. And so dumping it on the beach is an anathema because it's a visual blight. There's no pollution in the sediment and there's no negative effects from it. So great, let's just put it out in the surf and let's get that done. And the EPA is likely ready to roll on that because they say that you can't do more than 50% silt because in almost every other location, silt is binding heavy metal, silt <coughs> is binding pollution. And in our bay, we do not have industrial sources of pollution and our stormwater programs are working and our ecosystem is in recovery and they just don't have any grasp on that. And, and so instead of being rewarded for that, I believe we're penalized because we have eelgrass and eelgrass is going away elsewhere and we have long fin smelt and long fin smelt are going away elsewhere. Larry has got to go to school to remember to say clean sediment, reusable clean sediment. It's not dread spoils anymore, Larry. It's not mud and it's not silt. It is reclaimable sediment with which we can fight climate change and we have a choice. You want to be New Orleans or you want to be Holland? Are we going to be proactive or are we just going to let it run in? <laughs> so um, the Army Corps has, Larry did do a good job in saying that the Army Corps has responsibilities separate from ours. We have the marinas and the shallower areas to dredge. But the lack of dredging in the freshwater channel by the Army Corps of Engineers has caused that channel to become elevated in terms of its bed that backs up into the marina and if they were dredging the federal channel, we wouldn't have an issue in the Woodley Island Marina, just because that's the way sediment is. It's kind of like water. It seeks its own level. So we need to get on that. And, it, and it's one of those funny things that it eluded me. Um, the, uh, the land disposal in the interim, before we can go into the surf, we're going to get that from the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board. The water that is under the ground, under your feet, is automatically des designated as a municipal and must be protected. So therefore, dredge spoils, whoops, clean sediment from the bay um, that goes into pits on the, on the marina here, on the, on the peninsula, they presume it's going to mess up an aquifer down below that's fresh water and that should be used for drinking water. In fact, our test show, preliminary test show, that it's estuarine water down there. There's already salt leaking through the sand dunes, so why can't we dump clean, reusable sediment? Uh, Dan Johnson is required by the Coastal Commission for tsunami and climate change to get 100,000 cubic yards of fill. That's like a couple times around on the Woodley Island Marina. <laughs> so um, I think we're going to get what we need from the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board. I think we're ultimately in the next few years, and really in a five-year time frame, we need to get a cord from the EPA and be able to go offshore and into the surf. Because, you know, 10 years from now, energy to do this could be 10 times as much, which means you have 10 times as much expense, which means we're not going to be able to do anything. So it has to be least energy, least cost, right now, we get to a cord, and then it will be possible for us to maintain it into the future. Um, and uh, so we bought a dredge. PG&E, so there's the 
the nuke. And then they decommissioned it. And they had an intake. And they didn't need it. And they said to our commission, what do you think? You guys want this? We'll sweeten the pot. We'll give you a couple hundred thousand dollars. And my fellow commissioners said, why on earth would we take that over? So we drove a harder bargain. And what we got was we got money enough to buy a dredge so that we wouldn't have to pay $600,000 just to get equipment here every time we dredge. That's mobilization costs. And we could train locals and start to dredge the marinas, Fields Landing, Woodley Island, Eureka Marina, and other incidental areas around the shores of the bay that are shallow. And so I thought, here we go, we're out of our bind. Because then it isn't this thing of like you have to get 100,000 cubic yards in a year or 50,000 in a year. You can just go get it and go get it and go get it. And so I thought, happy days are here again. That was more than five years ago. That thing has been completely tuned up. It's been completely rebuilt. We have a mile and a half of pipe. We had a deal with the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to take sediment from the King Salmon Channel to rebuild White Slough and Salt Marsh, and we couldn't we couldn't dredge salt the the King Salmon Channel because it's covered with eelgrass. But there was no channel there before pg e dug one, and then if we dredged it, it would be back in three years. But no, we were going to have to dig out hard ground at Fields Landing and create eelgrass habitat because pg e had said they would both do the studies and permitting and mitigation. And by the time they got done on what we we're going to have to do to dredge a cream salmon channel, it was a million and a half dollars in mitigation, and pg &E said, no, thank you. So um, in Newport Bay, the preferential treatment for Southern, Southern California areas that happen to be more well endowed than we, not, not just by a little bit either, they get to disturb 5% of their eelgrass at any given time, and then it grows back. We need that. I don't know why we don't have it. We had a $150,000 study, and I thought that was going to be the, the outcome, and then that the agencies would automatically salute, and then we would like get to that. No. We're in gridlock over eelgrass. And you know why? Because it's dying in Morrill Bay. It's dying in San Francisco Bay. It pains me to tell you this, but I mean, I can give you facts all the way down the line. I'm studied at this at a very, very detailed level. And so they go, it's like the spotted owl, remember that? It's like everybody else chopped down their trees and then Six Rivers had trees and they said, no, you can't chop down your trees, you've got spotted owls. And so it's not fair. We have a functional ecosystem. It produces eelgrass. It covers the, the floor of the bed. Everywhere it can grow, it grows. So there's this funny deal about, well, if you're going to disturb eelgrass, why did they have us digging out the bank at, at Fields Landing? Because every place in the bay that eelgrass can grow, it grows. So therefore, if you need to mitigate eelgrass and plant it somewhere else, it doesn't grow there. It's not growing there already. And so, but it doesn't have to be mitigated because in three years, it will grow back. So if they gave us 3% of the bay, and Woodley Island is like less than one half percent of the bay uh, eelgrass system, then if it doesn't grow back in three years, then you're in the penalty box. But if it does, you get to continue to have this margin of safety so that we can have a functional ecosystem and the recognition from the agencies that we are doing the right thing and that by constraining us from dredging King Salmon, they stopped us from restoring salt marsh, which is the constraint of ecological function for the bay. Are you getting why I'm kind of irritated? I don't like irritated as a tone, but I can't ask it right now. So, <clears throat> the long fin smell hasn't showed up on a pizza lately, has no commercial value, but was once really abundant. And second in San Francisco Bay to the Delta smelt, pretty important forage base for other fish. They got wiped out in the Eel River by the 1964 flood, almost completely. They lived in an estuary. Now the estuary is almost completely restored, and Chinook salmon are resurging as a result. But no one's checked on longfin smelt, and every fish in the bay is in the eel estuary. And every fish in the eel river estuary is in the bay. And every plant species and everything else.